They say a picture is worth a thousand words. And as with everything in the Trump administration, that may be an understatement. Of course, there is this photo from the G7 tweeted out by a spokesman for Angela Merkel, showing the German chancellor with her hands planted, staring down at her American counterpart. There's also this one showing a white imprint on President Trump's right hand following yet another hard handshake with French President Emmanuel Macron. And then there's this one of IMF Managing Director and Chairman Christine Lagarde with a withering look as the president shows up late for a breakfast focused on gender equality. Of course, they will all be overshadowed in about 24 hours by the image of a sitting American president meeting with the leader of North Korea for the first time ever. The question now is what, if anything, will that meeting amount to beyond just that photo op? With that, I want to welcome in my panel, joining me on set, national political reporter for Axios, Jonathan Swan, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense and MSNBC national security analyst, Evelyn Farkas, political reporter for The New York Times, Ken Vogel, and joining us all the way from Singapore, friend of the show and Pulitzer Prize winning White House bureau chief for The Washington Post, Philip Rucker. Uh, Phil, I want to start with you since you are on scene, uh, the site of all of the action. I've been enjoying all of the Instagrams that everyone is uh, sending of the JW Marriott press file in Singapore. I want to read, though, from your piece in, in the Washington Post about this upcoming summit. You write, and I thought that this was a really on-point frame, quote, one is a septuagenarian American president, the other a millennial North Korean dictator, but each has nuclear weapons and mixes taunts and tributes to keep the other one off balance. Thin-skinned alphas, both men, are wedded to a go-it-alone leadership style, have a penchant for bombast, and are determined to project dominance when they finally meet. So uh, what, what is your sense of how things are unfolding there uh, on the ground in Singapore so far? And what do you think these, these two personalities, how is the president going to end up handling this? Yeah, Casey, well, they've both arrived here in Singapore uh, last night. It's now morning, uh, Monday morning. President Trump is scheduled to be meeting with the Prime Minister of Singapore later today, and then, of course, on Tuesday with Kim Jong-un. And they've been sizing each other up for months, really for years. Uh, Kim Jong-un and, and the North Korean delegation have been studying Donald Trump, the, the history about him, the art of the deal, sort of understanding his personality. Trump is doing the same about Kim. I think Trump sees this very much as a clash of personalities, as an opportunity opportunity to size up uh, the North Korean dictator, something no American president has been able to do face to face. And as he said the other day, he'll know within a minute or two whether uh, there's something here, whether Kim can come to the table and have a deal. Now, if you start looking at the substance of what that deal could be, it gets very messy because that's not worked out. It's unclear uh, what sort of deliverables uh, they could walk away from this meeting with. But Trump is very eager to at least have the meeting uh, and try to make friends with the dictator. Phil, is there a, a view that there may be any risk uh, for the president in simply having this photo op? Is there, what is the thinking? What has he been told about whether he should smile, how he should present himself in, in what we know is going to be an instantly iconic picture? Well, it's an iconic picture that the North Koreans very much want. Uh, for them, this is this is an achievement in and of itself, getting an audience with the president, putting Kim Jong-un on equal footing with the American commander-in-chief, uh, and it'll be used in propaganda back home uh, by the North Koreans to show Kim as a garnering respect around the world. And so the danger for Trump is that he's giving Kim something simply by shaking his hand and meeting him. Uh, we'll have to see what the body language looks like. I think it'll be really striking, for example, if Trump is kinder to Kim Jong-un than he was to Justin Trudeau in Canada and some of the other European allies that he was with at the G7 in Quebec the other day, uh, the body language from the photos that you showed at the beginning of the show was so striking. And we'll have to see if Trump uh, is more relaxed and, frankly, more enjoying himself uh, when he's face to face with the North Korean leader. So as you as you referenced a minute ago, the president did say it won't take long for him to tell if Kim Jong-un is serious about making some sort of deal. I'm going to show uh, our viewers what he said before leaving Canada yesterday. That's a good question. How long would it take? I, I think within the first minute, I'll know. How? I just, my touch, my feel, that's what, that's what I do. And if I think it won't happen, I'm not going to waste my time. I don't want to waste his time. 
Jonathan Swan, your take your take on that. Philip Rucker mentioned earlier that this is a clash about personalities, and I know you have some new reporting about that. Uh, the president has been in his briefings uh, fixated on Kim Jong Un's personality, wanting to know everything he can about him. He's been uh, asking Mike Pompeo, who's actually met with Kim, right. the only one of his top aides. But the uh, <clears throat> Allied intelligence agencies have compiled a very detailed uh, study profile of Kim Jong Un, largely taken from interviews with uh, some of his former classmates when he attended an elite Swiss school in his adolescence. Oh, interesting. And the profile, we, we got this from someone who studied it carefully, the, the classified binder. It, it bears a striking resemblance to the Kim Jong Un you see today. Uh, he described him as a, the, the young Kim Jong Un from these interviews, gluttonous, would eat himself almost sick, uh, <coughs> would be prone to fits of anger and outbursts of violence. Apparently, there were young children that he hit during this. He was an inattentive hmm. student, uh, didn't uh, attend class very much, and demanded slavish loyalty from his classmates. Slavish loyalty. Mm. Uh, Evelyn Farkas, uh, what does this sort of tell you uh, if you, I mean, if, if you're preparing the president to meet with this man? I mean, first of all, it's not surprising because this is the guy who had his brother killed and his uncle killed. So anyone who would be any kind of threat to him and his power has been eliminated. You know, we understand he's a pretty ruthless guy. Although he said that it's not military force, his his father had military first. Mm -hmm. He's saying economy first after we get our new. He wants a McDonald's. Program. Yes, I know. <laughs> so can make, and that he has in common with the president, with our president, of course, because our president loves hamburgers, <laughs> and I guess he likes McDonald's. I can't remember if that he was does. The, the Filet of fish, that he though. Hates. When he's being healthy, sometimes yeah. without the bread, actually. I Corey Lewandowski. Hmm. But um, I mean, I think I think if he's smart, he will he will study our president Kim Jong Un and just butter him up. He has one minute to butter him up. You know, but this there's only uh, it's it's impressive that the, you know that the, they're doing this level of preparation. Certainly, one of the concerns was that there was no preparation, and it would be nice if that preparation was also on the policy side and not just on the personality side. You know, famously. George W. Bush, when he was meeting with Vladimir Putin, said that he could assess, and he was someone who was, despite liberal sort of stereotypes of him, was actually someone who did prepare on the policy side as well as the personality side, and said that he, he looked Putin in the eye, could see into right. his soul, found him trustworthy and straightforward, came to regret. That <laughs> came to decide that assessment deeply. was incorrect. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, there's only so far that the personality goes. The policy is the key here. Yeah. And that was because he looked at the, the dossier that he had on, Putin looked at the dossier on Bush and knew he was deeply religious. So Putin purposely referenced, he had a cross and he talked about this cross and the meaning for him. Hmm. So in part, um, like... So he almost played, played yes, Bush in yes. the other way. Philip Rucker, I, I want to go to you on this because we, we have talked so much about how the president prepares or doesn't prepare for uh, all kinds of meetings, but none with as stakes, stakes as high as this one. And if, in fact, American authorities, uh, they do have this binder that, that Jonathan Swan is now reporting on, it still seems as though this president is absorbing that information only by having verbal conversations with people who've read it. Is that your sense? I think that's right, Casey. This is a president, uh, Donald Trump, who does not read his daily intelligence report uh, that's written out for him. Instead, he participates in more oral briefings. Uh, the CIA director will come into the Oval Office and show him graphics, videos, pictures, maps, charts, uh, anything that can help him visually understand the intelligence, because we know he doesn't like to sit down and pour over the written word. I assume that's the case now as he's preparing to meet with Kim Jong-un. You know, Trump has said he doesn't require much preparation for this meeting. That's not quite right, uh, according to Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, who says that he's been having very extensive briefings with President Trump for several weeks now, months really, uh, trying to prepare him for this, trying to get him to understand sort of the history of U.S.-Korea relations, the history of North and South Korea relations, sort of all the details that are at stake. Even if he's not an expert in the technicality of nuclear arms, uh, he at least can understand the, the sort of broader geopolitical dynamic. Uh, at play with North Korea as he prepares for the meeting. Let's turn now to all of the drama that preceded this evening, the G7 summit, just a few hours after the president called his relationship with G7 allies a 10. He pulled the U.S. out of the G7 joint communique as a result of what he called Justin Trudeau's, quote, false statements. He went on to tweet, quote, PM Justin Trudeau of Canada acted so meek and mild during our G7 meetings. The motivator, likely Trudeau's comments about retaliatory tariffs. Here are what 
two White House advisors had to say about this earlier today. Here's the thing. I mean, he really kind of stabbed us in the back. He really actually, you know what? He did a great disservice to the whole G7. He betrayed... Trudeau did. Yes, he did. We were very close to making a deal with Canada on NAFTA, bilaterally perhaps, and then we leave and Trudeau pulls this sophomoric political stump for domestic consumption. You just don't behave that way, okay? It's a betrayal, okay? Essentially double-crossing. Not just double-crossing President Trump. But the other members of the G7 who were working together and pulling together this communique. There's a, a special place in hell for any foreign leader that engages in bad faith diplomacy with President Donald J. Trump and then tries to stab him in the back on the way out the door. And that's what bad faith Justin Trudeau did with that stunt press conference. That's what weak, dishonest Justin Trudeau did. And that comes right from Air Force One. After those comments, Senator Jeff Flake tweeting, quote, fellow Republicans, this is not who we are. This cannot be our party. But once again, Flake, pretty lonely so far in his condemnation of the president. Uh, Ken Vogel, uh, how much self-awareness is there? Here? Yeah, I mean, the tweets from Trump minutes after leaving this setting, calling out another, another world leader for being, like, meek in person and then saying something negative after the fact, and then also the false statements. Trump has actually bragged about bluffing Justin Trudeau on the trade deficit using false statements. So it's pretty right. rich to see him accusing this, this foreign leader of doing the same thing that we've seen him do himself. Yeah, Jonathan Swan, I mean, this, we knew that the president had already caused all sorts of potentially irreversible problems with the Canadian government after making this announcement on tariffs. But the way that the this G summit's G7 summit concluded. I mean, is it possible? We've seen some tweets from John McCain, for example, that suggest that, you know, someday America's allies will, will see the Americans who are actually on their side. Is that possible at this point? Well, we've been talking to uh, European officials who are having the same problems uh, with the president, particularly, you know, when you look at Germany, even France, after they got to a better place, they've, that's been reversed, um, the UK. Uh, what they're trying to do is have this long-range view that this is a president for this moment, but um, move beyond that. But they still have the military ties and they lean on that. They look for positives where they can. But the reality is, transatlantic relations have not been this bad for a very long time. And no matter what Donald We're Trump We're not even says, talking about transatlantic relations anymore right. either. I mean, we're well, here you, on the you, continent. You, you, Canada too. But the, but the European relationship has right. been profoundly damaged uh, in the last few months over trade as well. But Shinzo Abe was sit, standing there as well. So, I mean, when it comes to economic issues, this is global and this is serious. And I think what was interesting to me, I think we need more reporting on this, but it appears, reading between the lines in the way the Post covered it today, that the Europeans actually staged an intervention. So that photo may have been that intervention where they said, okay, Mr. President Trump, you know, these are the facts. 70% of the foreign direct investment in the United States of America comes from European countries. And by the way, a lot of that goes to southern states that voted for Trump. But we should point out, I mean, that interview that particularly on the Peter Navarro did, truly I think that's one of the most extraordinary interviews I've ever seen from, a, from an official in this White House. And that's saying something. Hmm. To call what? one of America's closest allies, Justin Trudeau of Canada, to say that there's a special place in hell for him and to give him labels like weak and dishonest, that is taking uh, rhetoric to a level that I, I honestly haven't seen. And, and so I've, been far, covering this, I've been covering Trump for almost three years now. This, I mean, and, and, and the level of silence from most Republicans in Washington feels deafening. I, I guess they have so many things to uh, to be outraged about that they uh, th that they sort of pick their moments, but their moments are pretty rare, aren't they? Yeah, Phil Rucker, can I get you to weigh in uh, on this? At, at how this all unfolded? I mean, it seems like a classic case of the president, you know, making one decision in the room and then either watching Justin Trudeau's press conference, being briefed on it, and making uh, you know a very abrupt uh, decision and kind of reversing himself entirely. What are the consequences here? Are they are are these relationships reparable? 
Well, the consequences are quite severe for the relationship, uh, as the panel's been discussing. But the pattern is familiar for Trump. I mean, he's someone who, when he's in the room with you, whether it's uh, you know a fellow foreign leader or even just a journalist for an interview, he wants you to like him. He wants to try to create uh, a level of warmth there. He wants to. He doesn't usually confront people face to face. And then the meeting's over, and, and he goes off on Twitter as he did aboard Air Force One uh, from Canada and route to Singapore. I mean, this is just a, a familiar pattern for Donald Trump, and, and he, you know, he bullies sometimes, but he likes to bully with a distance. He doesn't like to do it face to face with the people he's trying to bully. You mentioned at the top of the show, too, uh, looking at that picture of uh, Angela Merkel and the other leaders kind of surrounding the president, that, that sort of dark, uh, almost angry look on his face and how that could potentially differ from, I mean, it certainly already differs from the picture of him receiving that letter from the North Koreans, you remember, in the Oval Office where he was smiling uh, and, and holding that, that giant envelope. I, we've talked about this a lot, I know, you know, whether he has a, an affinity for dictators, but I mean, what is it that explains why he's so hostile in a room with you know people that have been allies of the United States for decades and seem so warm and open to these other people who have been our enemies Well, he's so open to uh, to Kim Jong Un in part because it's his bid for history. Uh, you know, Trump it, it stuck with him from the first time he sat down with President Barack Obama after the election and before Trump was inaugurated. Obama told him, "Look, North Korea is the biggest challenge you're going to face in sort of a national security sense around the world, and this was a problem that Obama couldn't fix: the nuclear uh, development in North Korea." And so that stuck with Trump, and it's been a motivating factor ever since. He wants to out. Obama. He wants to solve the problem that his predecessors couldn't. And so because of that, he's in ultimate salesman mode right now. He wants the North Koreans to like him. He wants the North Koreans to come uh, to the negotiating table with him. He wants them to agree to a deal. And so he's willing to flatter uh, Kim Jong-un. He's willing to, you know, pose for that picture with the big envelope in the Oval Office uh, with a big smile on his face because he feels like this is his opportunity to do something truly historic as president. Hmm. Ken Vogel, you want to have a quick last word before we go? Yeah, to your point, Casey, about the warmness towards traditional adversaries uh, and the coolness towards traditional allies, you know who's loving this tension at the G7 is Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. I mean, his whole goal was to uh, drive wedges between the traditional Western alliances, and he's got that. Yeah. He's, he's meeting with the Chinese and other officials at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization annual meeting. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.